and good morning. Um, Yelia Soas, uh, sort of a hidden muscle. Uh, it's deep down there. It comes from the low back, and then it's retroperitoneal, and then it goes in front of the hip joint, and then ends in the lesser trochanter. It's a long muscle. It's a muscle that we don't see as very much, and we, a lot of the athletes don't know they have it. They know they have their biceps and a lot of other stuff, but they don't know about the psoas. So the psoas is a, a muscle that we often miss and are not really uh, that much aware of. So it's, it's, um, let's take a look at, at how it's important. As we've heard uh, already yesterday, there's lots of muscles uh, around the hip, and uh, they're all uh, important muscles for the stability of the hip and the pelvis, and as such for all the reasons that we can have groin pain. And the psoas is uh, a very important part of that. Uh, we also heard a bit about the, the anatomy and the fibrous cartilage plate in, in front of the symphysis joint, uh, the relationship, the functional unit between the conjoint tendon, rectus abdominis, and the adductors. And we are still um, out there with the jury to see how it really works and how much there is. I found these beautiful images in, in a recent published uh, paper here, um, and I had to look to see if power was involved in this because I thought those was very beautiful dissections. But uh, as you can see, like it was illustrated yesterday, some some um, some ligaments uh, that are maybe crossing, and like um, Ernst Childers told us about yesterday, and we can see the very close relationship of all these muscles. So these muscles act as Pelvic stabilizers, uh, the uh, adductors are very important. We know that. Uh, we know from the core stability that uh, uh, Sako uh, Vukovic told us about yesterday uh, is uh, important muscles as well. Uh, the uh, balance between the muscles of the lumbar spine and the abdominal muscles. And recently, as we heard of the uh, from Lars Anderson, the kicking, the adductors are very important as well. So. Where do the psoas come in here? Well, let's take a look at the kicking. Um, There's actually a Danish study from 99 uh, where they looked at kicking and looked at the flexors, hip flexors, especially the psoas muscle. And they found actually that the net muscle talk about the hip joint is flexor dominated during a soccer kick. So it, it, it they are very important, of course, for the, for the soccer kick. And uh, the especially the hip, uh, the, the, the muscles are activated uh, even during the uh, deceleration of the thigh. So, so we have a muscle that is constantly working. It's working concentric, eccentric. It's really an important muscle. And it's stabilizing in both ways. It's working from the back to the leg. But it's also when you're in a stance phase, it's working from the leg up, stabilizing the pelvis and the low back. Well. Then you would think that this muscle is will have to, in, in, in footballers who are kicking a lot, it would be a big muscle, at least on their kicking leg. And Julia Heights from Australia showed us in a study of Australian Football League that uh, it was actually significantly larger on the side of a preferred kicking leg. Kicking leg. Um, and this uh, asymmetry in their study, and numbers uh, included, wasn't that big, but still they couldn't find any relation to the number of injuries. So this fits very well into to what, you, what you would think. But then I found this uh, little more recent study, a Spanish study, looking at tennis players and soccer players. And they found that um, they both sports were associated with a similar increase in muscle volume of the reserves compared to normal controls, not uh, doing elite sports. Uh, quite a lot, actually, one third bigger. Um, and in the tennis players, they found uh, an asymmetry as well. Uh, actually, the non-dominant side, which has to do with the way you're playing tennis, going across your, your, your body. But the soccer players, that has similar vo volumes. And I'm, it's, so it's, it's quite contradictory. It could be that AFL football is maybe a lot to do with kicking with one leg, and it's not maybe so technical with the kicking side of it. And we all know Spanish football. And uh, they can kick with both legs and do anything with both legs. So it might be the reason for that. I would like to see this one on Norwegian football, for instance. 
Um, then we also have the, uh, the FAI. And um, I've been working with, with groin problems for many years and, and being a, an orthopedic surgeon, I started to do hypertroscopies 10 years ago and, and realizing that, oh, I thought I sort of had some system in it and now I, I realized there was something we absolutely overlooked. And thanks to uh, authors like uh, Reinhard Ganz and Mike Leunig and others, we have really realized that this is something that we, we need to take a look at. And there's no doubt that uh, the FAI is an important uh, factor in, in, the, um, in, the, in the groin pain. And, and how does that affect the muscles? How does that affect, the, for instance, the iliopsoas? Well, you could say if you have a footballer with FAI morphology, and I say morphology because in my mind, FAI is not a pathology. It can develop into something that can be a pathology, but FAI is a morphology, and we see it in so many uh, athletes that it's, 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 uh, it has to be some sort of a natural development, not necessarily a pathology. But this often uh, results in decreased flexion, decreased internal rotation of the hip joint. Um, and for an athlete to run, kick, jump, this lack of flexion and rotation, well, it has to be substituted. It has to be compensated by some, some movement, some stronger muscles, some, some better coordination. Um, and this leads um, to that the muscles that are acting across the pelvis, they will, will uh, have an increased load. They will have to work more. Um, so if you, if you have FAI and you are doing a lot of football, a lot of football training, you will have to compensate for this uh, lack of uh, movement. And to do that, you will have to have stronger muscles. So um, this means that these muscles are, if they're not strong enough, they are at risk of uh, fatigue and as such of injury. And there we have a whole list of muscles and structures around the pelvis, around the groin, around the hip, that can generate, that can get problem, get in problems, get in, in trouble because of the uh, FAI, because of the decreased range of motion. And the psoas muscle is the focus of, of my talk now. But there's a lot of things there that we still haven't realized really. Uh, Chris Larson has recently in a paper raised the question is the sports hernia issue, uh, incipient hernia, whatever you want to call it, is that related to the hip joint? And it seems that this could uh, also be a, a, a problem. So, but let's get back to the psoas. We have the, um, we have the psoas, psoas tendon, uh, we have the, the psoas muscle coming here, we have the iliacus, they're joining, and we have the psoas tendon running down here in front of the hip joint. And in this uh, ultrasound image, you can see the psoas tendon running here. You have the acetabulum here. The labrum will be right here. And you have the femur femoral head here. So there's a close relationship between these structures. Uh, so the psoas uh, is, is maybe part of the hip joint as well, at least related to it. So if we look at <coughs> iliopsoas-related groin pain, what can, what can generate that? Well, we heard yesterday from, from Andreas Serna that uh, we have some acute lesions in the iliopsoas muscle. We also have some situations with tendinopathy, muscle tendinous junction lesions, and muscle pain, whatever that is. Uh, active trigger points, um, muscle spasms. Uh, there's lots of words out there we actually don't really know, but we all know the feeling of having pain in a muscle. The snapping iliopsoas is another entity. Um, and then maybe labral lesions. I'll get back to that. Could be part of the entity iliopsoas related groin pain. And then the post-operative overuse. I think that's a very important thing for the hypotroscopists and something that we have realized in recent years that you have to be able to diagnose all the soft tissues, all the muscles as well, and treat them as well uh, when you are treating uh, patients with hypotroscopy because the iliopsoas is the muscle, as I described in the beginning, very strong, and it's involved in so many movements and so much uh, work that when you have pain after a hypotroscopy, you are using two crutches, you are limping a little bit, you are very careful, you don't, you're, not, you're afraid to do too much. The iliopsoas muscle is there, and it's tight, and it's working, and it's working, and it's working. So very often, I think a lot of the problems we have postoperatively with patients having anterior hip pain, groin pain, it's very often related to the iliopsoas. So again, 
we need to be able to examine and diagnose and treat uh, iliosoas problems. So I'll take it one by one. The acute groin problems, as Andrea showed us yesterday in our uh, material here from Aspatar, we have uh, now 67 uh, acute groin injuries, and 15% of those were actually acute iliosoas lesions. We also have the tendinosis. Uh, we know the tendinosis from the uh, Achilles tendon, a spindle-shaped um, uh, thickening of the tendon. Uh, and we've seen that quite a few times, looking at several hundred iliosoas uh, long-standing problems in Copenhagen. And we can see that sometimes we see this spindle-shaped uh, iliosoas tendon. What is, what is it? Is it the same as we see in the Achilles tendon? We don't know um, yet. But there's no doubt that it's, it's part of it. And then the muscles, this is just to remember me, that it's the muscles are, it's a huge muscle. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a very strong muscle. And of course, you can get pain there. The ili iliacus is very difficult. Um, I think the iliacus, as uh, Dr. Nabil told us about yesterday, is, is, uh, there's a lot of things we don't know yet. Uh, it has three parts. Uh, it has, uh, it, it's adjoining the iliosoas, uh, the psoas into the iliosoas tendon. And uh, how much is it actually involved? It's a very difficult muscle to examine clinically because every time you put your finger down there uh, to try to palpate it, it's sore in anyone. So, because probably of the fascia, uh, very tight there, so it's, it's difficult to examine the iliacus part by itself. How do we uh, look at these iliosoas related problems? Well, the location of pain, proximal anterior thigh, anteromedial groin. Decreased strength when we uh, test the muscle, you, we can do it in this position. Uh, we'll get back to that in the workshop, uh, how uh, we, we do all these tests, but this is, um, a good way of trying to isolate the iliosoas as much as possible. Also, when you stretch the iliosoas muscle using, for instance, the Thomas test, as here, uh, you can evaluate if it's tight and you can evaluate if it's painful. And then you can palpate it. You can palpate it at the level of the sias. You can palpate it under the ligament, uh, medial to the sartorius, lateral to the vessels. Um, and you can get um, a feeling if the iliosoas muscle is involved. Also, you can examine it do using the impingement test because when you do the impingement test, flexion, adduction, and internal rotation, remember that you are actually also uh, squeezing the iliosoas quite a lot and a lot of other structures, as uh, Professor Golano just showed us. There's lots of structures there in this region and they can all, all be uh, pinched and, and squeezed as, as you do the impingement test. So remember, the impingement test uh, is... Uh, not uh, it's in itself uh, specific for FAI. There's no evidence-based treatment programs for, for your psoas. What we do is using uh, the basic treatment program for the doctor-related injuries, but then with a particular focus on exercises for the psoas. For instance, a progression like this, going from very light exercises, increasing and increasing, and in that way you can sort of gradually increase the load on the psoas. We use all the exercises to stimulate pelvic balance, adductor strength, and low back strength as well. We did a recent uh, hip flexor strength training study uh, looking at, uh, we did it in a randomized way with footballers and one team. Uh, half of them did uh, three times a week for six weeks some strength training. And as you can see here, we had a 17% increase in strength training. Uh, in, in the strength using this uh, rubber band training. So it might be quite uh, relevant as well. Uh, looking at the internet, I found this one, the psoas bum walk, should be a psoas training. Christian and I had some fun back in the house looking at it and trying to do it. Um, I'd be very happy to talk to anyone who's got experience with training patients with a psoas bum walk. So the final uh, thing is the relationship between the psoas and the um, and the labrum, and as you can see here, this is a labrum and this is a psoas. They are very, very closely related in the hip joint. Um, and this is something that we as hip arthroscopists have been aware of. One good thing is that if you need to do a partial psoas tenotomy, which is done sometimes in snapping uh, internal hip, um, you can do it from the hip joint. You can see... Uh, the psoas tendon is, is coming, this is in the hip joint, and you can see 
the psoas tendon is right here. Sometimes it's open like this, you can see it in the joint. Sometimes you know you have to make a, a small uh, nick in the capsule and then get out there to it. And if necessary, you can take the tendinous part of the tendon away, leaving the muscles and knowing that the vessels and nerves is behind there so that uh, you don't have to be that afraid of it. If you release this iliopsoas tendon, you preserve 40% 40, 40 of the uh, muscle tendon unit uh, at the uh, level of the lesser trochanter. If you do it a little above at the labrum, it's 60%. And again, another study has confirmed this. And my last slide. Um, labral lesions is something that has been recently uh, raised as, as a possibility as well that might be caused by the iliopsoas. If you have a snapping iliopsoas or you have a very tight iliopsoas and you have this very close relationship, well, you can, in an hypotroscopy, find an image like this where you have the labrum and you have right there where the psoas is behind there, you have an inflammation, something's going on, and you might have a situation where the labrum is, is uh, injured by this. And as you can see now here, we cut the capsule, and this is the psoas tendon in here, this is the capsule, and this is the labrum. So there's a very intimate relationship, and if you have a big, tight, or snapping psoas, you could have problems with your labrum as well, and this is something we also have to consider. So I'm sorry, it's, it's still very confusing, and it's, it's, there's a lot of things we have to consider, but I think a lot of this makes it even more important to be able to examine and treat the iliopsoas muscle as much as possible. Thank you very much.